Hello, everyone. Joshua Gilliland and Stephen Tolafield here. We've come home from Comic-Con. It's Tuesday. We are both tired. We are middle-aged and feeling it. Stephen, how are you? I'm hanging in there. Like I said, I have my cup of coffee to try to get me through the evening. Um, it was a wonderful weekend. I had a great time, um, but I am tired. I am tired. There was a lot of walking. So the the reports of Comic-Con's demise because of the two strikes, grossly exaggerated. Very much so. Same number of people there. And with less Hall H things happening, all those 6,000 people went to the exhibit hall and the other panels, making it really, really crowded everywhere. Thir Thursday on the show floor felt like Saturday. Yeah. And there was... There are places I didn't even bother trying to get to on the exhibit hall floor. Yeah, it was, um, I was surprised that even though it did feel a lot more crowded and especially as you noted, some of the um, smaller panel room lines were really long <laughs> because people weren't in all age lines. But I have to say, I feel like, and I, I've seen this reflected in sort of other accounts too online, that the vibe was so nice. It was so chill. And for the most part, um, people were getting along great. I read that a lot of comic retailers had their best years in decades, maybe, because more people were just not standing out behind the conference center, <laughs> the convention hall, um, waiting for Hall H, and we're inside buying stuff, which is great. And I was so glad to see it. And we just had a great time. Yeah, I did too. It was a fantastic getaway with friends. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's like, we got to hang out because we went to the Star Trek panel in Hall Amazing. H, where we sat in the first row. That doesn't happen. Likely will never happen again. No. So we got photographic evidence. We were there. It it was real. It was fun. Yeah. So probably the first and last time I'll be in Hall H. So it's, yeah. uh, man. It was great. And uh, the, the Legal Geeks panels, I thought, went really well, too. I was really happy with them. Great turnouts, um, really good vibes, um, really fun. Um, did you have, how did you feel about them? Pride. It Good. just uh, everyone, everyone yeah. worked so hard, and the Indiana Jones panel was lightning in a bottle with attendance. That yeah. was wild. There was probably an equal number of people who wanted to get in who couldn't who were already in the panel. So that's a nice ego boost. Uh, I just had someone email and ask for a couple slides. She works at a toy company. Won't say which one. Oh, nice. And uh, so this is her email. This was by far the best panel I attended in SDCC. So props to you and all the rest of your team. Oh, that's great. Was that the Indiana Jones one? No, it was the Marvel panel. Oh, nice. My so goodness. Talking about you and Crystal and Judge Nahara and Nari and me. So Crystal, right? Oh, yeah. She said Crystal, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah, so they, they wanted the uh, slides about Colin Cosmo, a bad dog. And <laughs> That's great. She said she was yeah. laughing too hard to take the picture. So it's like... <laughs> That's great. Um, I also got a comment on one of my social media posts with... The, I showed the pictures that you posted about that panel. And it was from a, a woman attorney who I've known for decades. And she just commented that she was so pleased to see that the panel was mostly women and um, women of different ages and different backgrounds. And I thought I shared that I was really proud too, that um, that you and the Legal Geeks make a really um, concerted effort to um, provide representation on panels. And I think that's a great uh, compliment. That is very nice to hear. We, this year wasn't balanced because the Indiana Jones panel was mostly guys. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> we balanced out <laughs> overall i guess but on the flip side the marvel panel was mostly women right so it's like it balances out but mm -hmm. i was like this is weird because i was just looking at the interest level majority of guys went towards indiana jones and uh, i think it was an age possible age issue um i don't know because again somebody who was like seven when raiders came out that 
they connect with it on a deep spiritual level. So, sure. uh, but yeah, I was very happy. Good. It was just, it's a vote of confidence to put us at 7 p.m. each night because they believe people will come back from dinner in order to see us. And That's they do. Huge. And just good folks. So that was just, it was a fun, great weekend. And I am still tired from it. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm still feeling it for sure. But <laughs> glad to, glad to feel it. And you know what? Can't wait to do it again. We, we have a list of ideas already for next year. That's right. And in also been thinking about WonderCon. So lots of things to look forward to because there's no shortage of cool material coming out. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll see what how the strikes impact any releases for things that might are not done or need reshoots, that sort of deal. Right. Because there's might, going to be some delays. Yeah. It might be a while before we do and or. <laughs> that, that might be a while. Hey, you know, I've, I've had some questions. Maybe you can tell our listeners, do, were any of the, were either the panels recorded? Is Can people find them anywhere? They were both recorded. They haven't been posted yet. Okay, great. So they can find them on the blog. Um, where, and or wherever they, they are. Yeah, great. They'll go out on the podcast channel this week. So, Fantastic. All right, I have the edited uh, Marvel one, excuse me, indie first, Marvel's being worked on. Great. And uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So, Excellent. Yeah, good, good content, good content. Well, let's jump into Secret Invasion, The Har Harvest, which has a plethora of legal issues. And just to dig into this, it begins with the, you know, the US president has been shot and he's going into surgery. They're gonna to have to crack his chest. So he's not doing well. So my immediate question was about the 25th amendment. Did the vice president immediately become acting president under the 25th amendment while the president was in surgery? It's not stated. I think technically the answer should be yes because of how the 25th Amendment works, provided that there's a letter from the president saying that, hey, if I'm incapacitated, the Veep takes over until I'm out of surgery, back under control. There have been several historical applications of this and several trying to avoid it. So, because it makes the VP acting president. So first up, uh, Reagan, when Reagan was shot by John Hinckley, Bush should have become acting president. The, there wasn't a letter on file for saying that would take place. So that would have required a vote of the cabinet. And they didn't want to do that. Bush Sr. didn't want to do it either. So his authority was a little bit murky while all of this was going on, while President Reagan was in, under surgery. And because it was the first time in history that this was an issue and they were terrified of the idea of, do we really want to be first and, and fearful of the amendment? Uh, the second to skirt around it was Clinton did have surgery while he was president. I think it was leg surgery or knee surgery. Mm -hmm. And Gore did not become acting president. So I don't know if Clinton was actually put under or if it was just like a general, but that was a little troubling that they left him, um, you know, and again, in a murky situation. First president to actually use it is Bush 43. Because he got a colonoscopy, which meant he was going to be knocked out. And he went with all that's going on. No, Cheney could be in charge for a few hours. So Cheney was the first acting president while W was getting a colonoscopy. I think he had more than one over eight years because that's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, third, Trump, when he went in for a colonoscopy, he refused to sign things over the Pence. He refused to have any anesthesia and stayed awake for the procedure, which is wow. 
disturbing on multiple levels. That is insane behavior. Yes, it is. And Biden had, again, colonoscopy. And uh, Harris was the first woman to actually assume the role of president. Interesting. I guess I missed that, that she's technically the first woman president. That's really cool for Uh, a couple hours. hours Yeah. Yeah. How cool, though. Yeah, it's like, you know what? Nothing happened. (laughs) Everything was A-OK. Yeah, I wonder, that might be a good trivia question someday. Who was the first woman to have the title of president of the United States? And it would be... Um, Kamala Kamala Harris. Harris, Yeah. Well, she was, well, Joe was getting his routine colonoscopy. So... (laughs) There we go. So we have no idea what what the TV show does because they don't address it. Is do we know? I was just Googling and I couldn't find an answer. Do we know who the vice president is right now in the MCU? We don't. Okay. Which which is why I'm bet, betting it's Harrison Ford. Oh right, got it. So because I, I don't think the president's going to make it through episode six. Mm. I've been wrong before. Mm. But if we're going to get to Captain America four with Harrison Ford as president. Thunderbolt Ross either gets elected or assumes the presidency. And if if you lose a president to an alien invasion, that could explain some things that would be happening by the time of Captain America 4. Because we would we don't respond well to trauma. And especially if you kill a president, you know. World War III nearly happened after Kennedy was shot. So things got a little heated. A Secret Service agent at the White House nearly shot Lyndon Johnson like 48 hours after the assassination. Because again, tensions were high mm-hmm. with everyone being freaked out. Uh, when Reagan was shot, you know, there was an accidental escalation as well because people were freaking the hell out. And that's not good in the nuclear age where all life on the planet can end in 17 minutes. Be really destabilizing, right? Uh Uh-huh. Because again, we, some of the responses are almost automatic, which is terrifying. So the beauty of a human being is they can say, no, I won't turn the key. Problem with a computer program that says, if I detect Soviet missiles, I'm launching. What if the Soviet missiles are because of a solar flare? Mm. We blow up the earth because whoops. Um, and there have been human beings both on the Soviet side and the US side that avoided a nuclear holocaust with this is wrong. I'm not pushing the button. Good. Thank you. We appreciate your service. Razor thin margins there. God. So again, why I'm why computers can be scary. So we then get to Gravik, who uh, does a rousing pep talk where he kills somebody who questions him. And he also orders the summary execution of Priscilla because she didn't kill Fury. That is some <sighs> toxic management techniques there. Way to stifle uh, um, dissent. Pure rage. I mean, it's the Machiavelli view of would you rather be feared or loved? He's clearly picking fear. And the good way to have fear is just to kill a couple people publicly. And he does that twice. Unless you count the attempted murder on him, that's like six or seven. Like he has a very public body count for the people he's supposed to lead. Oh. Here I, go. Yeah, go for it. Sort of a side note, I, I'm curious, because we saw in this episode that, or we heard that Gravik used to work with Nick Fury, because um, Gravik was on the team that was doing the harvesting of the DNA of the Avengers. And I, I'm not sure I've caught or that it really sank in what changed for Gravik? Why did he get so radicalized? I guess it's, I, I gather it's his impatience with them not getting a home world, but it seems like he's just done such a 180. Um, I'm curious if you had any thoughts on that. No, because it does, I think it's impatience. Yeah. I mean, this is someone who spent from childhood for 30 plus years, and close to 30 years, 
being in the service of the United States as a spy that's not even acknowledged. And he wants a home. But it doesn't explain a tipping point. Yeah. It, what it was normally for someone to get radicalized, something happens. And the intensity of his sort of autocratic vision for him being the one who's going to get it done. It's, um, it's I, I wonder if there's more there that, because he, there was, that was him in the flashback, right? When Priscilla um, sort of introduced him to Fury. And so I wonder if there was just like a falling out between sort of that father, son, mentor, mentee I, that we haven't quite yet seen. I'm, I'm really curious if there's more to it than that. Yeah, did something happen during the blip? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, that, you know, with Fury gone, he just got very angry and felt that the promise had been broken because if Fury was the linchpin, that's not good. Uh, yeah. I don't know. And they haven't explained the rage. Yeah. Because uh, it's one thing, like, they want a homeland. But like, if everyone's working and happy, like, what's the, what's the trigger to riot uh, to go? Let's exterminate the humans. That's a large leap for feeling disenfranchised to go. Let's commit mass murder. Yeah, and and to radicalize a population like that requires kind of a messianic figure that he's become. And and I'm I'm just I'm curious, like, why he took that leap uh, and took it upon himself. But maybe that's just something that goes unsaid. Yeah, yeah it, and we, we only have so many examples. Like you look at the rise of Hitler mm -hmm. you know, and, and the Nazis and, and the Nazis electing Hitler chancellor because there's, he's not directly elected, but the Nazis are directly elected. They had economic stagflation, hyperinflation, you know, just there was bad things happening in post World War One Germany that made radicalization easy. Like if we had done a Marshall Plan in Germany post World War One, you know, we would not have had a World War Two. Is something like that in the works with with the scrolls feeling disenfranchised? Hmm. Or did they just get fed up after waiting decades? To be seen. Yes, uh, late to nine. All right, I should shouldn't have to say this. Summary executions are bad. <laughs> yeah, not lawful. No, and bad. Yeah, <laughs> attempting to murder Gravik. Uh, I I have mixed feelings on this because of murder is bad, but they decide to take him out. Right. This is. Yeah, this struck me as kind of the, is what we were sort of talking about in the Marvel um, panel at Comic-Con about uh, whether there's a necessity to defense when you know that someone is going to do something really terrible, can you take them out, as you said, and say that I did it to prevent a greater harm or a greater emergency. And generally you can't, as we said, because it, necessity is really just for emergency situations. And yes, he's kind of going on a rampage, but it's not like there's a greater harm that's about to happen that second. Um, the law sort of contemplates you contacting the authorities and getting law enforcement involved and not just taking the law into your own hands to prevent the, prevent the future crimes. Also, you can't take advantage of the necessity of defense if you've been substantially complicit in creating the emergency that you're trying to stop. And that's and if you're if you've been going along with graphic all along and you've been setting these terrorist wheels in motion, that might be a, a tough sell for the prosecutor. Yeah, these aren't uh, this isn't Valkyrie. Right. Uh, you know, we'll just execute Hitler. Oh, okay, and put in someone competent, like <laughs> the World War II could have. Ended differently if the Germans had put someone who was not crazy in charge. Luckily, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. they left the megalomaniac in charge. There isn't, from what we can tell, a, a, a fitness for office requirement. Like if a US president went off the rails like that or governor, we have safeguards in place, but it requires you know, people actually following protocol and, and stopping 
something terrible from happening. But yeah, it's it's a tough one because I understand wanting to stop to go like he just killed the dude in front of us. Right. Now, Gravik arguably does act in self-defense for the guys who put a bag over his head. However, he then takes the ringleader out and in front of an amassed crowd slits his throat. Right. Stephen, is that murder? Murder one, murder two, or manslaughter? Your well, thoughts? yeah, first, I mean, it's an interesting point about self-defense because if he feels like there, you do have, you are entitled to take enough action to prevent your great bodily harm or death um, up to and including lethal force if it's if it's genuinely um, something that someone's going to kill you but um, but at that at the point that he had and he sort of murdered a, a few people but by the time he murdered Beto 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 um, that the the threat to him had seemed to pass he had incapacitated Beto and there and there was no sort of further threat to him um and so then killing him is probably not would not be um defensible as a self-defense so then as you said that's the question of whether that is a whether that homicide or scrollicide do we have a word for that yet <laughs> is um was murder um in either the first or second degree or a manslaughter and of course, murder is uh, murder in the first degree is when um, the prosecutor can prove that there was some sort of premeditation or malice or planning. Um, but the planning doesn't have to be like weeks or days. It can be a momentary realization or mental state of I am going to kill you now. Um, and as long as the prosecutor can um, prove that malice of forethought or that mens rea, they can they can seek murder. Uh, murder two is anything not murder one, um, which is often situations where the victim dies because of the defendant's reckless disregard for safety or the prosecutor only really has proof to establish intent to harm and the victim somehow died as a side effect of that intended harm. Um, and then manslaughter is beneath murder. It's the situations commonly referred to as heat of the moment or heat of passion crimes, um, where it's voluntary, but there were circumstances that made the person react, made the um, defendant react in a way that um, resulted in someone's death. Or um, involuntary manslaughter is usually when it's like an accident often um, vehicular homicides or reckless manslaughter. So I don't know. Um, I guess I would put this, I guess if I was defending graphic, um, I would try to convince the prosecutor to, to um, plead it down to um, a voluntary manslaughter and argue that the sudden attack um, by a number of people uh, sort of got the adrenaline going in a way that he wasn't able to stop the violence once he had um, incapacitated Beto and then that resulted in a crime of passion or the heat of the moment homicide um, that would be a voluntary manslaughter. On the other hand, that was kind of a premeditated execution style murder. Um, I think the prosecutor might have a pretty easy time proving first degree to a jury who saw those facts. Yeah, I think it's first degree because of the blade. I think that makes mm. it premeditated. If it just been a neck snap, mm. I don't think there would be any premeditated conduct at that point. Right, kind but, of that reaching for the weapon makes a difference for you, right? Yeah, there's, there's the old quote from the Menendez brothers' trial that it was manslaughter until they reloaded. And right. these grabbing the knife puts it into the premeditated uh, category, I think. That makes sense. Occasionally. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do. Which, <laughs> which then brings us to like bad leadership trait of graphic just taking the position, I'll use everyone who that lives in New Scrollos, Scrollos as a target for nuclear annihilation in order to start World War III between the United States and the Soviet Union, excuse me, Russia, the United States, and all of NATO that would seek to blow up Russia, all seems like a bad, bad leadership choice of, ah, don't do that. 
I mean, this was, there was a quote by Clinton uh, during the, I think it was the 96 election, where he made the comment that I would absorb a nuclear hit before responding. And that's when I was a Republican. I was like, who's going to lose? Like, why are you okay with that as a policy position? While I was still in pro-missile defense, like that's a horrible thing to say because you're going to let people die. Gravik's taking the, I'm just going to sacrifice my people for the, what, other 900,000 roaming around? Yeah, that seems like a very high price to pay. I'm wondering if he's got some, like it's it's an illusory sort of offer or something. I don't know. It's uh, it's a weird, I don't quite follow the the logic there. Yeah, I mean, scroll roadie was like, what the hell, dude? Yeah. Like, this is, I mean, I don't want to incinerate, you know, all of the scrolls living with you because we know you're going to survive somehow. But what about everybody else? Uh, just mm, how to lose the room. Uh, we then get Sonia arresting the scroll scientists. Uh, it's something with a D. I don't remember their name. Did you catch that? I I heard it, but I I'm not uh, remembering it right now. Yeah, we're both exhausted. So I'll Google it really quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I stall. So I think that arrest is lawful. She has probable cause to do the arrest, even if the uh, information uh, was acquired through acts of torture because she's now done that twice and that's not a good um, policy for law enforcement to be doing anything like that of uh, causing harm in order to get information, but she does it twice. Uh, the issue then turns on her, the arrest is made and maybe they, they have no intention of actually prosecuting. The issue is stopping the harm. You know, looking back to um, uh, like the Boston massacre bomber, uh, you had the issue of there was a delay in reading the Miranda rights to the suspect. And they were able to, you know, you can argue with a straight face and an exurgency exists because you're trying to stop a greater harm. Like, are there more bombs mm -hmm. around Boston? Um, and you're willing to, you know, take the issue of, yeah, he hasn't had their, his Miranda rights yet, but we're still going to do this. You know, alternatively, you know, a federal judge went to the hospital with a public def federal public defender and read the suspect their rights because that matters. Now, on the flip side, Sonia taking the headshot, I think was justified because the scroll, uh, thank you for looking up Dalton. Right. Mr. Dalton had a gun to the head of Mrs. Dalton. If that's the real names, probably not, but we'll roll with it. And, you know, he was threatening the life of his wife who, because she was willing to, you know, turn state secrets. Maybe she wasn't his wife though. Maybe they were just co-agents who are assumed the role of a married couple. Highly possible. We don't know for sure. Yeah. We, we do know that he's not a good dude. Right. And, and, and I guess the, that would be a question of whether that was, of course, reasonable force to, um, under the Fourth Amendment, to effect that <laughs> arrest, basically, of stopping him, um, or that was unreasonable. And like you say, I guess if if he is threatening to harm the person who has information that can stop the the, the larger crimes from happening, that might be arguably reasonable force in that situation. But you also have defense of others that right. you know he was threatening lethal force against Rosa, and uh, Sonia's not messing around. We've seen her shoot. Now, now three people. No qualms about torturing. That doesn't seem to bother her. So taking a headshot, she she's down with that. She's kind of terrifying. Yeah, I would not want her mad at me. Nope. No. We then get into uh, how to bury a scroll. 
we we have rules on burying people. Uh, the law of the dead is actually really well regulated because uh, bodies can carry disease, and um, you know the the rule is we want to get a corpse buried or cremated as soon as possible to protect the living. We also want the corpse being treated with respect. We do not allow for at home cremation. There's local ordinances in place, state law in place to prohibit that. Yeah. I don't think... know what they have in England, but burning a body at home, problematic. Right. It's pretty taboo in virtually all Western countries. In my in my research, I discovered that there are two places in Colorado that permit it, um, an open air cremation, like a funeral pyre, but only one of them is open to the public. And they, they're permitted to do only 12 each year. So um, it's, you have to book it pretty far in advance. I don't know how <laughs> you would book it in advance, but, um, but apparently you could do that. And I found that there's actually a bill in the main legislature. The main legislature has been trying to pass a bill for about two years now to permit open air uh, cremations. I guess they're really into their Viking uh, funeral um, uh, lore there, but that is, so far is not on the books yet. Well, I'm going to have to update my will to expressly state I don't want to go out that way. Um, <laughs> no means no. A nice hill overlooking the ocean, that, that would be plan A. So, yeah. yeah. But don't, no, thank you. Uh, good research. Now, now, we end with Fury being asked by Sonia, uh, why aren't you going to call your special friends, meaning the Avengers? And he says this fight is personal and thus he's not going to call the Avengers because he was raised by a single mother and everything he knows and is between his ears on how to go save the planet. Uh, what was your reaction to that? Because I have a strong one. I felt like that was just kind of the writers trying to figure out a way to justify not having um, Brie Larson show up on a TV show, <laughs> um, it seemed like pretty thin. I feel like if I had some super powered friends, regardless of what I felt about um, sort of my own self-confidence and my own confidence to um, handle a, a difficult situation, I would, when there's that many lives at risk and I know I have an ace in the hole, I don't, I think I would probably play it. What was your reaction? Uh, grossly irresponsible. Like again, we got home from Comic-Con and we're tired. I would not want to go try to stop World War III from happening tonight. I, I would call in help. If, if it was you and me trying to stop a nuclear exchange, we're gonna call some friends. Uh, <laughs> we're not doing this on our own. And I, I thought it was just kind of over the top macho. It's like, so we have the Brit, who now looks like she's leading MI6 by herself. It's like, call in the troops, dude. This is, I mean, again, end of human history. Maybe tr treat it with seriousness. Yeah. I mean, I, pre I kind of was appreciating the writers trying to find a story beat that would make sense in the context of the, of the plot, but that was... Was a bit of a stretch for me. Yeah, I, again, I would have preferred this like being the end of episode two with him, you know, I'm going to go rally some troops and bring in some actors from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and do it that way. Uh, we're going to go solve the problem. Right. You know, it's like, this is why S.H.I.E.L.D.'s supposed to exist as opposed to I'm going to go walk into New Scrollos with the leader of MI6, and the two of us are going to wage war against uh, thousands trying to stop a nuclear holocaust from happening. With just my sidearms and my patch. Yeah, it just, I mean, the suiting up was pretty cool. <laughs> However, except why did he need like four mausoleum? 
things. Each one had like one thing in it. <laughs> it's like that was a waste of space. It seemed dramatic. Very dramatic. Yeah, or maybe it's like, <laughs> what if I just need the eye patch? I suppose. Yeah. It's just that I'm just going to, but that's a lot to remember. Which one has the jacket? Which one has the gun? Um, I thought it was just, it was dramatic. It looked cool. And maybe that's why they did it. That was the sole purpose. Will Samuel L. Jackson look awesome? And the answer is he does. Yeah, he's back to old Nick Fury now. Yeah, I'm good. Got to get him ready for the Marvels. So. There we go. Yeah, so overall, a little uneven, but I'm on board. Uh, I still like this as one of the better uh, Marvel TV shows, uh, even though it, there are some problems with it. Yeah, I'm going to I'm looking forward to seeing how they tie everything up in the finale. I like you said, I think you mentioned that this could have maybe been a four episode miniseries, maybe not uh, six, but um. But yeah, it felt a little dragged out at times, but um, looking forward to see it, seeing how it winds up. Yeah, and they've tried keeping it small, like you know, intimate with a very specific group of characters to go in and deal with a very big problem. The, the challenge is it's a big problem and more people need to be involved uh, being, you know, again, man on the wall or yeah. Does Nick have LMDs <laughs> to be helpful? I don't know, but I would be down with that. Find out. Find out in a few short hours. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'll stay up all night to watch it, but no. No, it's going to be a later viewing for me, for sure. Before, no spoilers. Well, probably before work. <laughs> so that's a. Uh, wow. So with that, everyone, we had fun at Comic-Con. If we saw you at Comic-Con, it was great to spend some time together. And uh, we will have future events uh, that you can see us. But more on that uh, as we march towards the future. So until then, everyone, stay safe, stay healthy, and above all else, stay geeky. Take care.